All right, here we are at four o'clock. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the Computational Health Informatics Program, CHIP, our landmark ideas series. And we have an incredibly exciting uh, and unusual for us speaker from astrophysics, um, Shep Doleman, who's talking about the Event Horizon Telescope, imaging a black hole through global collaboration. And I'm hoping that he will inspire us not just with the nearly science fiction aspects of what he's accomplished, but also with the reality of how team science, data sharing, and collaboration happen. So the landmark series, um, the landmark idea series webinar, um, you'll be listening. Uh, we will have a, a robust Q&A session. So put your questions into Zoom chat as we go. And um, uh, we'll, we'll start with a, a brief intro, then the presentation, questions and answers. We'll have some brief closing remarks. So very uh, quickly, because I know there are folks on this call who don't know about uh, the Computational Health Informatics Program. Uh, uh, my name is Ken Mandel. I'm the director. Uh, I'm a physician by training. And at CHIP, we were founded in 1994. We have over 20 faculty uh, exploring the full range of uh, biomedical informatics from molecular characterization of the patient up to uh, public health uh, and uh, COVID uh, uh, disease informatics, uh, as well as care system redesign. You can learn more about us at chip.org and uh, you can uh, also join us uh, in future landmark series events. Uh, so if people wanna uh, tweet about this, I throw, I throw up a proposed hashtag. Um, Shep uh, is new to Twitter, I think. So give a junior researcher a break and follow him um, at Shep Doleman, help him build his career. Um, you can follow us uh, at Boss Chip as well. So, um, and I wanna mention that uh, the informatics program does also have um, a search out for uh, faculty, um, uh, at Harvard Medical School faculty search to work with us, um, not on astrophysics mostly, um, but on our other uh, topics, uh, we're searching at the instructor, assistant or associate professor level. You can find out more at chip.org. So, you know, briefly, um, Shep uh, Doleman uh, is a longtime friend. Uh, I've been in awe of his work for more than two decades. Um, despite knowing him so well, uh, I still have goosebumps anticipating what we're about to hear today. Um, like the magical experience of walking into a planetarium or stepping out under a truly dark star-filled sky. Uh, many listening to this um, are in medicine. And as I mentioned, think about this just through the lens of what we do and what we can learn from it um, as a field in addition to just enjoying the treat of hearing something that's uh, very specifically outside our field. Shep uh, Doleman is an astrophysicist at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, and founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope, a synchronized global array of radio observatories designed to examine the nature of black holes. Um, he's a, a Harvard Senior Research Fellow and a project co-leader of Harvard's recently established Black Hole Initiative. Dr. Doleman was awarded the 2020 Breakthrough Physics Prize in Fundamental Physics as the founding director of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration for the first image of a supermassive black hole. Dr. Doleman was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2019. And I love that he's come so far that he doesn't even have to mention his Guggenheim Fellowship in his bio anymore. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's now jump in and I will uh, ask Lisa to switch from my presentation to Shep's and off we go. Okay, can I share? There we go. Yes, Shep, you can do it yourself. Okay. Oop, 
I just lost it. Okay, can everyone see that? Right. Okay, so Ken, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here. As, as you mentioned, I've known you for many years and uh, we've been just swapping stories about this. And uh, you've, so you've seen this from part of the beginning, uh, but it's really a treat to be able to, to speak uh, to this audience specifically. And I hope that we can have some interchange on how science is done in your neck of the woods and how science is done in my neck of the woods. But basically this project is, uh, is a visionary project to see what we thought was impossible to see, to make the first image of a supermassive black hole. And if we could do that, then we would test Einstein's theory at the one place where it might break down at the edge of a black hole. And when we think about fundamental theories, we want to take them to the most extreme cosmic laboratories we can to see where they break down, because that's where the interesting physics, that's where the interesting discoveries are. But more than that, these black holes, as you'll see, are dynamic engines of creation in the universe. So to understand the most energetic processes right at the event horizon will teach us why the night sky looks the way it does. So it's a laboratory, but it's also a test of Einstein's theory. And this has been a, a two decade long excursion into the unknown. Uh, there is no linear path for a project like this. I'm sure there are uh, projects like this also in medicine. Uh, there is no point A to point B. Uh, in some sense, we built a bridge plank by plank as we, as we went along. So we were very confident that we could do this at various stages. But it, it also felt a bit at times like we were riding a bicycle downhill and all of a sudden we realized we were going way too fast. And we didn't really know if we had control over the situation or you're swimming in an ocean and all of a sudden a wave just knocks you over and you realize there are forces outside of what you have control over that you have to deal with. And I think that will happen in many big visionary projects. You have to adapt. Um, so with that, without uh, further ado, I'm going to start off this talk not with an astrophysics image, uh, but with something that you might be more familiar with, just to create some common ground here. So this, of course, is the first x-ray ever taken by Wilhelm Rentgen in 1895 of his wife uh, Anna's hand. You can see her wedding ring there, left hand. Uh, this will be very familiar uh, to all of us. This is uh, how we diagnose broken bones and so forth. But for me, the important thing here is that it gave us access to a hidden world, that we were seeing something that it was almost forbidden for us to see. We were seeing the inside of a living human being. And there's no record for what Anna's uh, reaction was to this, uh, certainly not something you want on your Christmas card. I'm sure she felt it was not her best photo. But, but for us, it really starts a whole new field. And for the Event Horizon Telescope, this is the kind of thing that we were after, the same kind of reaction comes from the first micro uh, lithograph of, of a flea uh, taken by Robert Hooke in 1665. Again, a hidden universe now made visible for the first time. So this is the direction that we wanted to go if it gives you a flavor for uh, uh, how we were approaching this task that we didn't really know how to do. Now, on the astrophysics side, I want to give you a sense for what it means to look for a black hole. This is the galaxy Hercules A. It's 2 billion light years away. And at the center of this galaxy shown here in the middle with this light region, we think there's a 4 billion solar mass black hole, a black hole that weighs 4 billion times what our, what our sun does. And you think to yourself, well, how can that be? What, what are our clues to that? This is optical light. If you reorient yourself and look at this in the radio, you see something completely and utterly different. You see twin jets of light speed material, you know, jetting from the center of this galaxy and the span of that is one and a half million light years. It's huge, this is a gigantic structure. The amount of energy in these lobes is equivalent to 20 billion supernovae, 20 billion stars exploding. And it's directed along these two jet axes. No chemical reaction could ever give you this kind of energy. Even nuclear fission, nuclear fusion would be hard pressed to convert the necessary mass into energy that you see here. The only engine that astronomers understand can produce this energy 
is accreting matter, matter falling onto a supermassive black hole. It approaches the speed of light, gives up its luminous energy, and then is directed to the north and south poles of the spinning supermassive black hole into the jets that you see. This is what put astronomers in the 1970s on notice, that there were monsters that were lurking in the centers of these galaxies. Now, this shows the basic mechanism at how these jets are, are launched. Magnetic fields are locked into the event horizon of the black hole, and like an egg beater, they thrash and they centrifugally launch charged particles that are constrained to move on those magnetic field lines along these bipolar jets. Now, let's start thinking about black holes from the standpoint of gravity. So that was a phenomenological uh, approach to, to black holes, but it all began uh, with Einstein's reimagining of what gravity was. So Newton had taught us for many years that there was a spooky action at a distance and that different masses of objects created forces on other masses. And that's how you could understand gravity. Einstein said, no, it's a deformation of space-time, as you see in the upper right here. So a large body can be seen as deforming space-time, and then other objects move around it. And it was understood that we could test this by looking at the deflection of starlight around the sun. During an eclipse, stars would appear to be in different positions than they actually were, because light would bend slightly as it came to the Earth. And the deflection of light for the, the, the sun's mass would be 1.7 arc seconds, which is 1 2,000th of a degree. So we're looking at very small deviations here, but Einstein's prediction was much different than Newton's prediction. So in 1919, uh, the, the well-known astronomer uh, Eddington set off in, uh, in ships to Sobral off the coast of Brazil and Principe off the coast of Africa to look at the eclipse of 1919. And this is one of the exposures that he made. And the horizontal white lines you see are the precise locations of stars that are seen to have moved. And when they analyze these photographic plates back, back in England, they realized that the offsets were as Einstein had predicted. And overnight, he became a sensation. This is the front page of the New York Times. Uh, in November 10th, 1919, lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science, more or less agog. More or less, who knows, but they were agog. And, uh, and, and this really made Einstein a household name and changed forever how we viewed the fabric of the universe. So when we think about the Event Horizon Telescope, what I want you to keep in mind is that we are very connected to these early pioneers. We draw inspiration from these findings and we see ourselves as part of a long narrative that continues this story. So the next up was uh, Carl Schwarzschild shown here with the customary early 1900s roguish mustache uh, and his real claim to fame was that in the trenches of World War I he solved Einstein's equations just after the 1915 announcement of general relativity and he showed that if you could compress all the matter into a point source, into a spherically symmetric point or a very small sphere, there would be a point at which, at a certain distance from that matter, light could not escape. Right? This was the, now the famous Schwarzschild radius. Now, this puncture in space-time through which you can go but never come back was seen as being a mathematical curiosity. Nobody thought that matter could ever collapse into something that was so dense that it would form a black hole like this. They didn't, have, they didn't even have the name for what this would be. But over the course of, of the next decades, we came to understand that there are extreme cases of matter in the universe. So white dwarves, for example, that are seen in the night sky because of the way they interact with other stars in binary systems, were seen to be the size of the Earth but they could weigh as much as the sun. And the density is about a million times that of what our sun is. So right away, we understood that there was matter that was incredibly stiff. You could collapse a star to the size of the earth and the electron degeneracy pressure, the fact that electrons do not like to be so close together would keep the surface of the star from collapsing any further. 
But if you go to higher mass stars, then they can keep collapsing until neutron degeneracy pressure takes over. Then now you can't put nucleons close enough together because of the, the Dirac exclusion principle. There you can collapse a star to the size of Boston with extreme densities, 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube. And then in the 30s, Oppenheimer and Snyder realized that if you had even in a larger black hole, even the stiffness of neutron matter would not be enough, enough to prevent the collapse further. So now we began to understand that theoretically even black holes could exist. And once you collapse to the event horizon, it's really defined only by its mass and its spin. And then combined with this in the 1970s, we began to see those images that I showed you earlier of these jets coming from the center of galaxies. That also showed us that there were black holes of sizes that were billions of times larger or more massive than these at the centers of galaxies. So we have two different kinds of black holes, one from stellar death, and then one from accretion of matter in the center of a galaxy. Now, how does a black hole radiate so much? So it turns out that accretion is an extremely efficient way to get energy from matter. If you were to drop an average apple onto the ground, it would liberate about a joule of energy, which is enough to power your cell phone for about a second. Now, if you take that same apple and you drop it onto a black hole with the Earth's mass, you don't change the mass at all, you just change the configuration of it. It would fall the full radius of the Earth, 6,400 kilometers, and by the time it hit the event horizon, it would be going uh, very close to the speed of light and it, would, it could liberate 10 to the 16 joules of energy. Now that's enough to power Manhattan for an entire year. So just the configuration of matter, the harnessing of the gravitational potential energy can liberate enormous amounts of energy. And this is why in a paradox of their own gravity, black holes can be some of the most luminous objects in the universe. They attract matter, they liberate luminous energy, and in the centers of galaxies, they can outshine the combined light of all the stars in a galaxy. Now, what would these look like if we could have infinite resolution goggles? So, so again, uh, using uh, uh, the pioneers as a touchstone, we can go back to Max von Laue, Nobel Prize winner, 1921. And he, wa he shows here in this monograph the impact parameter of a black hole. So you start off to the right where we are, and you start tracing light rays to the black hole, some of them you would think would fall into the event horizon shown here with the classic expression of two times the gravitational uh, constant of Newton times the mass divided by the speed of light squared, very simple equation. And, but it, it turns out that when you trace these back, it's really the photon orbit. Because one of the wonderful things about black holes is that photons are constrained at the very innermost orbit to move around in circles. In, uh, around a black hole. So he realized that it was this photon orbit, or 3 gm over c squared, that formed the size of the shadow you would see. And it's the tracing of this light ray all the way to the right side of the screen here that shows how big the black hole should be. So we should see a shadow with the square root of 27 over 2 times the Schwarzschild radius in size. And then outside of that, then you would begin to see some light. Now, so with this in mind, I'm going to show you the two places in the universe where we can hope to resolve this kind of structure. And I'll get back to what this looks like in a moment. So this is the Milky Way galaxy, familiar to some of you who have seen it far away from the city lights. And if you were to zoom in to the center of this galaxy and look at radio wavelengths, you would see streamers of hot ionized gas falling into the center of, of, our, of our galaxy. And at the center there, that white dot is radio wavelength emission from what we think is a 4 million solar mass black hole. And the Nobel Prize this year was won for this work. The motion of stars around an unseen mass at the center of our galaxy. Now, this really is astonishing stuff. I mean, this should knock your socks off. This what you're seeing here is orbits of stars that can move around you know, within the lifetime of an astronomer 
uh, around this unseen mass, which is shown as this star here. The only thing this can really be is uh, a dark object, a, a supermassive black hole that weighs 4 million times what our sun does. So this is one area that we can look for uh, these objects in. Another one is where we actually made our first image, which is M87. It was uh, this jet here that you see was discovered in 1918 by Curtis and in an optical image. And when you rotate it, you can see this very carefully. You see a jet just like the one I showed you at the beginning of the talk coming from the center of this galaxy. Now, if you look at it in, the, in radio wavelengths, you see that same jet with the same dimensions. And on the other side, you see this ghostly image. And that's because this jet is coming on the right almost exactly to us. So it's a Doppler boosted. And just as a train whistle is higher in pitch when it's coming towards you, these jets, when they're coming close to your line of sight, are extremely bright. We can't see the one that's back propagating. The one that's moving away from us is entirely invisible to us until it hits the intergalactic medium on the lower left. And there you see this impact of this jet with the with the tenuous gas between galaxies. Now moving in even more, now we're a thousand light years across. We see this jet continues on to the center in the lower left. Moving even further with the best telescopes we have, we're now 12 light years across and we still have not resolved that bright feature on the lower left that's launching this light speed jet. Four light years across, we're still seeing this Russian doll effect of the same self-similar jet as we get closer to the, the black hole. And this, up until a few years ago, was state of the art. This was the best image we could make of the M87 uh, core. And the whole point of the Event Horizon Telescope was to ask, what would we see if we could image that central set of pixels there? Could we see what was launching this jet? Now, the best way to really visualize this is, of course, with modern computers. I'm going to show you an animation here in which you should imagine all the gas around the black hole shown here as the red circle heated to billions of degrees because as the gas falls onto the black hole, it is heated through friction to these very high temperatures. So the black hole is surrounded by a three-dimensional flashlight of intense radiation. And if you follow the light rays around that black hole, you see the black hole bends and twists all that light so that very far from the black hole, all the way at the Earth, you wind up seeing this feature. And again, this is the feature that's the square root of 27 times the Schwarzschild radius across. That's the photon, the lensed photon orbit of light being warped around the black hole. You also see this tenuous emission around the black hole that comes from some of the gas in front of the black hole, some behind, that is just being bent slightly so it's grazing the edge of the black hole. So you wind up seeing this, uh, this luminous flow. Now, if we could measure this ring size, if we could lay a ruler across space-time, we would be able to verify this feature, verify that Einstein was correct, and also independently measure the mass of the black hole, because again, the size only depends on the mass. Now, in the two cases that I've described to you, uh, Sag J star in the center of our galaxy and M87, which is 55 million light years in a distant galaxy, the sizes of that feature are 50 micro arc seconds and 42 micro arc seconds. That's small. So if you were to put an orange on the moon, they would, that would, it would subtend about 50 micro arc seconds. So we're trying to see something that is exceptionally small. And as I'll show you, we have to make a new kind of telescope to see it. Now, there were real pioneers in this, in this field. So in the late 70s, Jean-Pierre Luminet also made these complex simulations. And he used very primitive computers, probably computers that are, have no more computing power than your phone does. And he was able to uh, map out the space time around a black hole. And this is a hand-painted image of India ink on Canson negative paper of what a black hole would look like from 1979. And of course, the interstellar team <laughs> has done a little bit better job, uh, but really he captured all of the, um, the main features of what we now know a black hole uh, should look like from these simulations.
Now, the state of the art comes from something like this. This is a supercomputing cluster derived simulation that is completely magnetohydrodynamic. So this takes into account all of general relativity, all of magnetohydrodynamics, and it shows you from an ab initio simulation what a black hole looks like as it evolves. And you can see, of course, that same ring feature with the, the tenuous plasma around it. So the challenge for the Event Horizon Telescope is to see all the way to the event horizon. Because imagine you are close to the event horizon and you're a photon that is emitted from this hot gas. You have to struggle and fight your way through all of this gas, through the interstellar medium, through the intergalactic medium, all the way through the Earth's atmosphere to our telescopes. That is a huge long journey and nothing can get in your way. You have to free stream from the event horizon to our telescopes. The one wavelength that we are sure can make that entire journey is a wavelength of about one millimeter. It turns out that all the barriers between us and the event horizon are relatively transparent at that particular Goldilocks wavelength. Now, we also need to get an angular resolution, as I've said before, better than this shadow feature. So we need an angular resolution of about 20 micro arc seconds. And since the angular resolution of a telescope is lambda, one millimeter over D, you need a 10,000 kilometer wide telescope. Um, and you also have to make it extremely sensitive because the amount of light coming from the event horizon is, is very, very faint. So the, the order of the day is to make an Earth-sized telescope that can look at these wavelengths and make it very sensitive. And if you were to blur this image to the 20 micro arc second level, this is what you would expect to get. So this is really what we were after at the outset of the Event Horizon Telescope project. And these, these, by the way, are some wonderful simulations done by the University of Illinois group, uh, Wong, Prather, and, and Gammy. Now, as we think about building one of these telescopes, you might have in mind a large parabolic dish, which is normally what we use to collect radio waves. And it's very simple conceptually to see how this works. You have a nice parabolic shape, a plane wave comes in, bounces off that parabolic curve, and then because of the virtue of the shape of the curve, all the rays focus and combine uh, at the focal point, and that's where you put your camera. So through geometry, all the waves combine at the right moment, at the right place, to give you uh, the, the combining light power of this telescope. We can't do that because we could never make a telescope this 10,000 kilometers apart, of course. So we use something called very long baseline interferometry, which at its heart is basically like a massive disaggregation of collecting area. So imagine smashing your telescope with a ball peen hammer and putting shards at different points on the earth and somehow orienting them so they all focus their light to one point. That's essentially what we're doing here, but we're doing it in radio waves and we play a few tricks. So on the upper left there, you see the black hole and we use radio telescopes that are in different parts of the earth. And we record the radio waves from the event horizon of that black hole. And we time tag them to the picosecond with hydrogen maser atomic clocks. And then we record them on hard disk drives. We essentially freeze the light as it comes to these radio telescopes. And we combine them months later at a special purpose-built supercomputer that aligns these recordings until they just match. So when you think about it, this is exactly what is being done by the parabolic dish. The parabolic dish ensures that the two waves get to the focal point at the same time by its geometry, whereas we use a, a supercomputer to align these recordings back and forth until they just match. So it's really the combination of these two telescopes that give you one data point for the Event Horizon Telescope, one point in the virtual Earth-sized aperture. Now, why is that important? It, so it turns out that, of course, any image, any two-dimensional image can be deconstructed into sines and cosines. This is Fourier analysis. So you know, any image you see, whether it's a picture of Einstein, a picture of Marilyn Monroe, it can be deconstructed into a bunch of sines and cosines. And 
one pair of telescopes in this array is sensitive to one of those sine waves, one of those cosine waves. And if you get enough of those cosine and sine components, then you can reconstruct the image. And that is what we mean by interferometry. Now, I, I want to point out that uh, the amount of data that we're sending back here is in petabytes. And the only way that we have figured out to get this data back in a reasonable amount of time is to load a 747 filled with hard disks and send it back. It, it beats any internet anywhere on the planet. So uh, we have all of our data delivered by FedEx. FedEx is truly part of the Event Horizon Telescope when you think about it. Now, there was a, a, a so this is all somewhat theoretical. And for a long time, we spent um, years developing the instrumentation to do this. And finally, in 2008, we made uh, the experiment that told us that there really was something to image at the heart of the Milky Way galaxy. So we, we made one of these arrays, this very long baseline array, with three sites, one in California, one in Arizona, and one in Hawaii. And we observed the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And we were able to measure its size. And, and we did it in the following way. On the short baseline between California and Arizona, the angular resolution lambda over D was large. So you expect the sensitivity of your telescope on the sky to be very broad. You should detect very large objects with that kind of baseline. And on the left here, you see a plot of the energy you detect between two telescopes and the distance between those telescopes. So on the left, you'll see a kind of a cartoon of what's happening here. If the black hole has a finite size, and it's shown here in red, then the short baselines have a big enough region of sensitivity shown here by the dashed line that you should get all of the energy of the black hole. And in fact, that's exactly what you see here on the short baselines, on the short distances, you get all of the energy of the black hole shown here on the Arizona to California baseline. When we went to the longer baselines, we're only sensitive to a portion, a smaller area of that region of emission. And that's shown here on the Arizona to Hawaii baseline. And because we saw less energy on those long baselines, we were able to immediately determine a size for this black hole. I, I remember exactly what I was doing when I saw this result. I was in my office and I ran back to the area that we were processing this and made sure that it was, it was real. This was the moment when we knew that there were event horizon scale structures to be imaged. Uh, at uh, at the centers of our of these galaxies, so the rest is really how you built this telescope. So we then decided to uh, really make the full push to make an imaging array because we could we wanted to make the the jump from just taking size measurements to really making an image. So we built bespoke systems. Uh, that would record these data at high speeds. We brought them to the IRAM 30 meter in Spain, the large millimeter telescope in Mexico, the submillimeter telescope in Arizona, two telescopes in Chile, the ALMA array and the OPEX array, uh, two telescopes in the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And we even sent teams to the South Pole uh, so that we could record radio waves from the most extreme environments on the earth. Now, this should give you much, much better imaging fidelity. In other words, we can record many more sines and cosines, and we can start to reconstruct an image instead of just making a size. But even these are not enough. Imagine you only had these, they would be silvered bits on a very, very large virtual mirror. But thankfully, the Earth rotates. So if you're sitting at the galactic center, this is what you see the Earth doing on a night of observing with the Event Horizon Telescope. And you can see on the left the web of interconnected baselines that form separate data points during an entire night. And on the right, you see for a given night of observing that they trace out a broad swath of the virtual aperture. So each of the points on the right is one of those sines and cosines. You see the full coverage you get for a night of observing. This is enough to start to make images. So with this in mind, now we started to build our collaboration. So that's what I want to turn to next. 
So um, I don't want to go through all of this, but uh, as it, you can, as Ken said, we should be thinking a little bit about uh, how these collaborations come together. So I wanted to give you an idea for all the moving pieces in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. On the upper left, you have the instrumentation working group. These are the people consumed with understanding how to build the instruments, how to deploy the instruments, how to test the instruments to make sure they're working. Then you have the data collection and processing working groups. These are the people who are processing the data. They run the observations that we make and they calibrate the data and provide error analysis. The data analysis group here in the middle, they do the imaging, they do the time variability analysis, and they create the images that are used for the scientific interpretation, which happens on the bottom right here. Then we have theorists in our group who work on all of the simulations, relating them to what we see to understand the physics at the event horizon and how well we can test Einstein's theories. And on the bottom, you can see that it wouldn't amount to a hill of beans if we didn't tell people what we'd found. And so we have talks, public outreach, publications, graphics and visuals, some of which you've seen, which are really part of telling the story. And on the left, you see that as with any large project, we have tools and repositories and we have to track all the versions of the algorithms that we use. That's an integral and critical part of, of the stuff that we do. Now, I'm gonna focus really on the imaging part of things, uh, which you see here as an exemplar of some of what we had to do in order to analyze the data and some of the protocols that we put in place to make sure that we didn't mess up as it were when the chips were down. So we started by having a, a VLBI data set to train our algorithms. So we wanted to set up an EHT imaging challenge. And this was really important for, for our project because we did, had no idea how to image. We didn't know what the best way of imaging a black hole was because no one had ever done it. Uh, were, was, was algorithm one gonna be the right way to do it using traditional deconvolution techniques? Were we gonna have a regularized maximum likelihood method, which was completely different? Would there be something from left field, which would be the optimal way of doing that? So we set up an online infrastructure, a harness, so that everybody across the collaboration could take fake data sets that were generated by this team. It was led by Katie Bauman, Kazu Akiyama, Andrew Shale, Michael Johnson, all early career astronomers. And in Katie's case, she was a computer scientist. They generated these fake data sets and then uh, let everyone use whatever algorithm they wanted. And then they had a way to combine them all to assess their efficacy, to compare them and ultimately rank them. And that is what produced the small subset of algorithms that we use to actually image the black hole. So this is an example of, of what we did. On the upper part here, you see six different images. These are all realizations with different algorithms of an input image that was used to create fake data that has errors in it due to turbulence in the atmosphere or noise in our telescopes, everything you might assume would corrupt a normal EHT observation. This is the actual input image. So you can see that in most of these, we did pretty well. Most of the algorithms recovered that, that image. This, by the way, was done before we had any real data. So we were just testing the algorithms. Here's another case, not so convergent. Now you have some things where maybe you see a ring, some where you don't. This is clearly a more complicated case that's confounding the algorithms. This was the input. Here you see a much more complicated accretion flow around the black hole where you have multiple features, multiple tendrils of emission that are confusing the algorithm and they make it more difficult to understand where the photon ring is. Here's another one. So we had a lot of different cultures across the Event Horizon Telescope. Not everybody was familiar with snow, uh, but I'll tell you if there's going to be a snowman at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, we're gonna find it. And we often interrogated all of these algorithms with uh, slightly off kilter inputs just to see if people were dispassionate about what their algorithms were producing extremely important to take the human bias out of these things. 
So l let's then ask ourselves how you, how you make an image. I want to give you an example of one of these algorithms. So typically, the way these work is we minimize um, you know, a kind of an entropy factor, or we minimize uh, a, a combination of what was typically seen here as a chi-squared, which is the fit to the data. And then we use regularizers to help shape the image. So we want to fit the data, which is the first term on the right here. But we also want to impose things like smoothness or positivity on the sky. Uh, I've never seen something on the sky that was negative, and we don't want our algorithms to dig a negative hole in the sky. So we have regularizers that steer some of the process. And there's a balance between fitting the data and also not making something that's pathological. And this is an example of one of these algorithms working in real time. And you can see that it searches through this chi-squared space. It's shaped by the regularizers. At some point, it will anneal. That's what you just saw there, where we bounce it out of a minimum, and then it goes back to searching on the chi-squared landscape. And ultimately, you wind up with an image that converges. So these are the kinds of algorithms that we set out to, to test uh, long before we got any data. Now, in addition to these imaging algorithms, these imaging challenges, then we had to test, design, and deploy a whole suite of new instrumentation. So we had one group that was working only on these algorithms. And we had another group that was busy constructing the real hardware. And this personally is what I love about the project. Uh, I come from this heritage of, of instrumentation and the, I like nothing more than going to the top of extinct volcanoes uh, and bolting things in and seeing them work for the first time. But there was something special about a 10 year period that we spent developing a whole new kinds of instrumentation. When I first got into this field in, in the early 90s, we were recording data on reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. And we had analog filter banks. Around 2005, we changed all of that. And we decided to move in a direction that was tethered to industry protocols and industry standards. Now we record on hard banks of hard disk drives with completely digital electronics. And you see the bespoke system that we have on the right, on the left are all the hard disks. And on the right, we have a few more hard disks at the bottom, but most of that is digital electronics that samples the waveform that originally originates from the, the black hole event horizon and stores them as ones and zeros on these hard disk drives. Now, the reason we had to reinvent this is because we were limited by bandwidth. The problem is that as you go higher in frequency, which one millimeter really is because it corresponds to 230 gigahertz, which is kind of at the upper end of what radio astronomers typically observe, the dishes get smaller because they have to be smooth. So you make up for that by ingesting wider and wider bandwidths. So we needed to go to very, very high recording speeds at all of our dishes. And what you can see here is the recording rate on the y-axis against the year that we deployed the instrumentation on the x-axis. And this goes for nearly two decades. This has been a long, a long, long development period. What's really striking for me about this is that the blue curve is Moore's law. We were able to harness 13-year-old gamers <laughs> and, and, their, and, their, and the need to game. Uh, and we rode that industry trend so that we tied astrophysics instrumentation to the same doubling time scale that was enjoyed by microchips. And that allowed us to go from a bandwidth of about one gigahertz here, or one gigabit per second, to 64 gigabits per second. And we kept up with Moore's law the entire way. That was the key to the sensitivity that allowed the Event Horizon Telescope to work. And that was a conscious decision. Uh, we, we could have continued to handcraft our instrumentation in-house, and we decided that it was much better to order everything on Amazon and write software. That was our capital expense. And then we could just upgrade to the next versions of whatever was being developed by industry. And that was really a game changer for us. So in 2017 in April, everything came together. So we had all this instrumentation, we had our imaging algorithms ready, and over a 
uh, uh, about a 10 day period, we had the array that you see there and we triggered five days out of 10 days. Why five days? Well, it's because we only had five days to trigger and we did it within 10 days because we needed the weather to be good at all of our sites. So typically for astronomical observations, you figure, well, I just need the weather to be good at one site. But for the very long baseline interferometric technique that we use, weather has to be good everywhere. And thankfully the weather was absolutely fantastic. And we got detections to all eight of our dishes. And, and uh, the planning was really the key. We had wonderful planners for this, uh, early career and, and late stage researchers with a lot of experience who put a huge amount of time into it. We ran dress rehearsals. We had checklists. We had very sophisticated go, no go protocols that were informed by test simulations of what it would be, um, what it would mean for us to lose one of our telescopes. And, and I'll get back to this bandit comment in a moment. But, but this is an example of one of our checklists. And I think this is one area where we might actually have some commonality between the medical field and, and astronomy. Uh, the problem is that when you get up to 15,000 feet, there's not a lot of oxygen and you do not want to be inventing things. You don't want to be winging it uh, when you're up that high uh, because we have what we call summit moments where all of a sudden you look around and ask yourself, what am I doing? What's going on? So this is one of the checklists that we use. And, you don't have to go through all this, but, but uh, this is a, a checklist that can be remotely monitored by a central facility that's at sea level. And that allowed us to have control over the entire array in a way that let us give feedback to the, to the field techs at the high sites uh, when people were comfortable at sea level and they could make very, very good informed decisions. This is another just illustration of the thought that goes into this. At the top here, you'll see that we carefully described all of the people who were going to be on deck to run the operations as a function of day and time. On the bottom, you see deci decision trees. So were we going to run during a given night? Were we not going to run on a given night? We put a lot of thought into understanding which telescopes were critical for our science and which could be left out if the weather was bad at that site. And on the right, you see the results of this. So we have, in this particular case, we ran for five nights and we triggered two of those nights shown in green. So we have a clear protocol for doing this and it depends on everyone sending data back on the weather and us making an informed decision. That the bandit comment is one that I'll get into just very briefly, uh, I was sleeping at two in the morning at the control center when I got a call from the from Mexico and uh, two of the cars carrying postdocs had been run off the road by bandits with automatic weapons. Now that's not something they teach you in Astro 101. And we had to make some very rapid decisions uh, that included the safety of our of our most precious resource, our people. And we made the immediate decision to call everybody back from that site. Uh, and, and wait until we understood the situation better. And ultimately, we just stopped observ observing at that site for the remainder of the time. So occasionally, you do wind up with a situation where uh, you have to make uh, very rapid decisions. So now let's talk about the data, because I know that's something that the chip is, is pretty uh, interested in. So we start with the raw signals from the telescopes. This is measured in petabytes. So we talk about data in terms of tons of disk drives that we bring back from these sites. Uh, this is a uh, postdoc Katie Bauman, who is uh, in, at the large millimeter telescope shown in the upper right here. And she's got just a small fraction of the 200 terabytes of data that were recorded at that site during that observing campaign. Uh, these data are stored uh, at the sites. Uh, the, I'm sorry, these data are stored when they come back at two correlation centers, which process the data. Now, during the correlation, this is when you have a supercomputer, whether we have one at Max Planck Institute in Bonn and one at the MIT Haystack Observatory. And you can see here uh, Kazuo Akiyama, Jeff Crew, and Vincent Fish, uh, who man and run the correlator at, at Haystack Observatory and are scientists there. So here, the data are combined. So they come down from petabytes to terabytes. So now you have something that you can't really walk around with, petabytes to terabytes, now you have something you can fit on your desktop computer. 
Then we have to calibrate the data. So we, we basically look at the data and we have to average it in terms of time and in frequency. And to do that, you need to phase stabilize the data. So on the right here, you see uh, amplitude in blue and phase in red, and you can see wraps in phase. So the phase is all over the place. And when we combine the data in a full circuit of telescopes, so we go from telescope one to two to three, and we combine all the data so that the atmosphere cancels, we wind up getting very, very pure phase information across the whole time, which is shown on the x-axis. Now we can average over long periods of time. Now the terabytes of data average down to megabytes of data. So we've gone many, many factors down in terms of data volume. On the left, you see uh, Lindy Blackburn, Sarah Isaun, and Maciek Vilgas, who are uh, respectively from SAO, uh, from Radboud University in, in Holland, and also from SAO, who are some of the key leaders in this effort. Then we image. So now we take all of this data and we use those imaging algorithms I told you about before. And this is some of us uh, during the first time we ever saw the, uh, the, the image of the black hole. And now everything is distilled down to an image which really can be compressed into kilobytes. So we've gone from petabytes of data to kilobytes of data and things are being stored in different places all along the way. And data sharing is really at the heart of the Event Horizon Telescope. It's a precept, it's really a, a tenet of the collaboration. And everybody should have access to the data to work on it as long as it is in service of the collaboration. So what do I mean by that? These are all the sites in red of the telescopes around the globe. These are the two correlators we use to process the petabytes of data. All the data goes from the sites back to those two correlation facilities. But then we have many sites that are working on calibration and imaging across the globe, including in the Far East and uh, in the US. And we translate all of the data that we correlate to uh, the cloud. We have found that uploading data at the terabyte level to the cloud is the fastest way to assume that it gets disseminated, the fastest way to disseminate it across our entire collaboration. And indeed, much of the computation work was done on the cloud. And then that allowed a simulation and model comparison to happen everywhere. So just to give you a, a brief tour of how data got back from the South Pole, here we are packing up disks at the South Pole. Here they're arriving at the Haystack Observatory with FedEx. We're unloading them with a forklift as one does with data. Uh, we're unpacking them and here they are uh, defrosting at the MIT Haystack Observatory. Now, the other thing I, I want to point out is that we paid particular attention to a review of the data. Now, I don't want you to look at this too closely, I'll, but I'll point your attention to a few things. Starting in August 2017, we started getting output from the correlator, which is shown here in the red boxes. So we had Rev1, Rev3, Rev another Rev3, Rev5. These were all outputs from the correlators. Meanwhile, the calibration team produced the blue boxes on the bottom. After every bolus of data from the correlator, we calibrated the data and made an engineering release. That's what ER stands for. And all of the algorithm people were allowed to work on those data across the entire collaboration. The, blue, the, the green boxes here show reviews. So we came together with regularity with a focused concentration of experts across the collaboration to review the data. The data were really the gold in the Event Horizon Telescope. And we had multiple reviews, each time looking at problems in the data, each time working, working on artifacts of the data, feeding back to the correlator, feeding back to the error analysis group, until we wound up with a convergent set of data here at the far right, where we started making our first images. But there was a well thought out progression Nothing was going to get by the error analysis team until it had been reviewed by the full collaboration. As an example, and as a, as a real touchstone of the way we did things, we had three completely separate data pipelines, HOPS, CASA, and APES, which processed the data independently. And we looked at statistical distributions for all of these different 
software pipelines and made sure that they were consistent before we moved on to the next level. This is also very important. This embodies what I like to call creative tension. You would think that the people who were working on apes didn't like the people who were working on CASA. You would think the people who were working on CASA were somehow antagonistic to the people working on hops because whose data was going to be the final data set? But it turns out that by ensuring and reassuring everyone that all of their work would show up in the final papers, everyone teamed together to work cohesively to vet the data set. So it didn't matter whether ultimately hops was chosen or CASA was chosen or apes was chosen. Everybody saw their role in it and everyone got to contribute to the paper that was produced. So now let's get into the imaging. So this is the, uh, this is the data. We have visibility amplitude, the energy on a given baseline on the left, on the, on the y-axis and the distance between the telescopes on the right, here's the data. If you try to image this with just a blob, it simply doesn't fit. That's the dashed line there. If you try to image this with a filled disk, well, you get these bounces that are characteristic of a disk kind of morphology, but they miss the second bounce here. If you have a ring, now you're talking. Now you start to fit the data. And if you make a crescent shape, now you start to see that uh, the morphology just in the data alone is, is, uh, is showing you something that is very exciting. And I, I was at a dinner when the postdocs came and showed me some of these data. And because we could see immediately these dips in the data, we knew that we had something very, very exciting. Uh, now the next step was to make the image. So here's where the team really came into play. We wanted to avoid any human bias. So we split ourselves into four separate teams. Uh, team one, two, three, four, largely separated by geography, somewhat separated by algorithm. And because we had Slack, because we had Zoom, because we had email, we were able to collaborate in near real time between these teams, but they were independent. The teams were required not to have any contact with each other, and they had to work completely independently. And the reason is, uh, this is a slide from, from my, my wife, Elisa Weitzman, who's part of the CHIP program. It is very hard to tell the difference between fried chicken and labradoodles. And we did not want everyone to think that they were looking at fried chicken when in fact a labradoodle was right in front of them. And we wanted there to be enough independent teams that we would be assured that if we saw something that was scientifically meaningful, that it was a robust result. And if you think this is hard, just try to tell the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin, absolutely impossible. So with the rubber hit the road at the Black Hole Initiative, in, on July 24th, 2018, when all four teams came together and for the first time showed their independently achieved results. And you can see that the four different teams using different techniques found that same structure. Now we could might have imagined that would happen because the signal was so clear in the data itself, but to have these four algorithms come and give us the same general size, the same general shape was hugely reassuring and, and, and the team was, was magnificent. Uh, this, is, this is all of us in the basement of 20 Garden Street in Cambridge, uh, where the Black Hole Initiative is based. And you can see here that uh, there are a lot of smiling faces. Um, and what you don't see is that there were people on a speakerphone, at least as many as you see here, all participating remotely. So this was really a unifying moment in the collaboration for us to see this kind of structure emerge. And then we spent the, a lot of time trying to make it go away. So we thought, what if we have trained our algorithms so that we dig ourselves shadows? So then we trained the algorithms on doubles all the way to the right, on filled disks in the middle, on other kinds of rings of different sizes on the left. And then we set them, once they had been so trained, on the original data again, and we still got the same results. We also looked at other sources. This is one of those jet sources that I showed you very early on. In the top, you see the core where the black hole is. This one is too far away for us to resolve the black hole event horizon, but you can see the jet moving at light speed towards the bottom of the image here. And again, all of the different algorithms 
found the same general structure. So we were very reassured that we were seeing something that was robust. We also had different days. We had four different independently observed days of data, and they all showed us the same general morphology. If you can look, if you look carefully, you'll see that these change from day to day. And that is also scientifically exciting. But the most basic result here is that we had confirmed this general structure. Now, the other thing that can be of interest is how do you know what the errors are? So on the left, you see the image that, that I just showed you from, from many different algorithms. And so you're seeing the, the average image. And one way to, to think about where we believe aspects of the emission is look all the way to the right. You see the fractional standard deviation across many different realizations of the image because there's no one right image. We just have a maximum likelihood image. And you can see here that the dark region shows you where you have the most confidence. So we really had high confidence in this ring kind of structure when we looked at many, many different realizations of the images that we could produce. Now, I wanna give you an idea for why location is important. If you only had two sites, you could only measure a blob, which you see here. If you add a third site, you can get higher angular resolution, but it's only when you get an outrigger site do you begin to see this ring structure emerge. And it's only when you have the full global extent that you get the ring. So it's really about location. And that's gonna be important in a couple of minutes. And then we can measure the diameter. So now we start to analyze the real results. So can we measure the mass of this black hole? Can we verify Einstein's theory? So we measure the, the radius of this ring as a function of azimuth around here. And um, you can see the, di the diameter and the uncertainty that we measure here. And I'm just going to show a couple of, ex of equations here on the right. The shadow diameter is that equation that I showed you before with the square root of 27 times this handful of constants, mass, Newton's constant, speed of light squared. But we actually measure the angular shadow diameter. The telescope measures an angle on the sky. And that's because we have to put the distance to the black hole in the denominator here. So we're really measuring an angular size on the sky, which is related to the mass of the black hole divided by the distance it is from us. And so we, we tend to write this, or astronomers do, in terms of a, uh, a, a gravitational angular radius shown as theta sub g here. I don't want to get too wonky about that, but that's because this plot here shows something very important. Across all four days, and across the three imaging algorithms that you see in the bottom right legend, we got a very consistent size of that ring of 3.8 micro arc seconds for the gravitational radius. That's mass over distance. And because we know from other astrophysical techniques the distance to this black hole, we can now measure the mass. So we've laid a ruler across space time using the bending of light around a black hole the distance we know from other means, and we measure the mass of this black hole to be six and a half billion solar masses. So let's break this down a bit. We've developed, we, we've developed these algorithms, built this array, did the observations, made these images, which you see here on the left. The ring diameter for M87 is an expected 42 micro arc seconds. The mass that we determined, assuming general relativity is correct, is six and a half billion solar masses. It is circular to within 10%, which is exactly what we would expect for this particular black hole, because remember it's pointed almost directly at us. So we're looking down the barrel of this relativistic jet. We'd expect to see a, a circular symmetry. And everything is consistent because other mass estimates that we get from stellar motions around the central parts of this galaxy also give us a mass of nearly six billion solar masses. So everything is entirely consistent. The asymmetry you see here, the, the bright part in the bottom and the dim part in the top, is because the gas is moving at near light speed around the black hole, circularizing. The gas on the bottom is coming towards you, so it's bright, and the gas on the top is going away from you because it's dim. This is, again, perfectly in, in keeping with all the sophisticated simulations that we do that show us that gas does move in these 
in these ways around a supermassive black hole. So for M87, we are perfectly consistent with Einstein's theory. No surprise, it's never a good idea to bet against Einstein. But to see this feature, to see this smoking gun from Einstein's equations, and to see it so clearly evinced in the data is rare in science. I would say it's rare in almost any field to see a prediction so clearly demonstrated with experiment. Now for Sagittarius A star, we know the mass and the distance much better. We'll be able to test Einstein's theory an order of magnitude more stringently with that source in the coming months. So now the big question I get is what's next? Okay, so yes, you've imaged a black hole, but you know the human condition is to be jaded pretty quickly. Uh, so everyone says, yes, yes, uh, what's, what's going on now? So the answer is that we wanna build a next generation instrument uh, that can make movies. So all of the blue sites you see here are ones that we are currently operating. And all the red sites are potentially new sites that we can use. Now, if you had double the number of dishes in our global array, let's say you had 20 dishes, as you see here on the left, then the coverage or the, the Earth-sized virtual aperture you get increases on the right two panels here from the blue points, which is what we had in 2017, pretty good, to the red points, which we hope to field in 2021. And with the next generation instrument, we get everything in gray here. So we're filling that out much, much better, much more densely. And even for the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, we can make snapshot images every 100 seconds. That's how good our virtual coverage is when we double the number of dishes. And that's important because at the bottom, you'll see the light crossing time the time it takes light to cross the event horizon for M87 is nine hours. What that means is that the M87 ring doesn't change its shape during a night of observing, but the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy changes minute to minute. So you have to make a movie in order to understand what it's doing. And that's why we need a next generation instrument to make a movie. And, and more than that, we can start to make this connection between the black hole and this incredible jet that's flowing out from M87. On the left, you see a simulation where the black hole is driving this jet off to the right, but it's very low surface brightness. It's very low signal level. So in 2017, we simply can't image that beautiful jet that's going off to the right. But with the next generation, array will be able to measure all of the structure of that jet in great detail and start to really study jet launching in these galactic sources. But really we're after cinema. Who doesn't want a front seat in the black hole cinema? So on the left, you see a model and on the right with the next generation EHT, this is what we think now we can produce with that array over the coming years. And we may even be able to do better with better imaging techniques. And then there's space. Why be limited to the surface of the earth, I say? Let's think big, right? So on the top here, you see the earth rotating. It looks so slow, it's lumbering along. We're slowly filling in this earth-sized virtual aperture. If we had four LEO, low earth orbiters, we would fill in the earth-sized virtual aperture almost completely. And that will give us real-time video of black holes. And why stop there? Why not go out to the second Lagrange point, which is collinear between the Earth, the Sun, out at a distance of, of a million kilometers? There you wind up getting angular resolutions measured at the fraction of a micro arc second. And this will allow us to measure the sizes of those black hole rings for tens of thousands of black holes across cosmic time. So this is where we're heading next. And if we could do that, then on the right, you can see the kind of movie that we might hope to get uh, within a decade or two using a space-based platform. Now, I wanna wind up by really focusing everything on the team. Uh, this is an extraordinary group. We started small when risks were high and we built up from about a 15 person team to over 200, now 300 people. Here we are in Hilo, Hawaii at our last uh, gathering. Uh, we have 60 institutes, 20 countries and regions. And to the postdocs and graduate students who are listening, early career researchers were the backbone 
of this effort. Everyone was given very strong responsibilities across the collaboration and across these projects. And, uh, and everyone performed phenomenally. I was, I was agog, there's that word again. I was agog at what was delivered across this collaboration by the early career researchers. Uh, here are just a couple of shots of people in various exotic locations uh, having fun because we do have fun. Uh, these are the sponsors that helped fund us, uh, a wide range of uh, funding agencies from across the globe and, of course, private foundations and industry partners. Now, as I said, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans unless you can tell people about it. And what we managed to do was pull off uh, six simultaneous international press conferences in Brussels, Washington, D.C., Santiago, Tokyo, Shanghai, and Taipei. And within five second window, we all displayed the black hole image at the same time. And this was, it took a little bit of doing to do that, but uh, this allowed everybody across the collaboration to regionally get to tell their side of the story to their funding and public constituencies. And that was extremely important uh, in terms of building support across the globe for this effort. Everybody wound up getting their moment their ability to tell the story. And that was extremely um, gratifying. Uh, so we came down the day after this announcement. Uh, it was a little shocking to see this image on the front page of every major newspaper around the globe and of course on the Google Doodle. Um, we estimate that between one and four billion people saw the image. So there is a human dimension uh, to this. And it is one that uh, I think is very important and we want to lever this going forward to generate support for our work. And of course, I, I'd like to honor Alex Trebek, who, who very, very sadly passed away yesterday. Uh, this was one of the questions on a recent show. I'll leave you to figure out what the, what the question is for this. So I, I want to wind up just by going through a couple of, of lessons, and we can talk about these during the Q&A. Maybe that's the best way to do this. But I, I do want to say that one thing I think that motivated us was a focused science vision. We truly feel as though we are in a hundred year handshake with Einstein. Uh, we write his equations every single day. We talk about the Schwarzschild radius every single day. Uh, history is really alive for us in this project. And if you ask anybody in the project at any career stage, they sense where they are in the historical and narrative arc of understanding the universe through general relativity. So that allowed us to focus and keep narrowly, uh, a, a narrowly defined deliverable at the end. We also managed expectations. We staged things so that we had continual progress without. We didn't say it's the image or bust. We said, first we'll measure the size, then we'll measure magnetic fields, then we'll start to measure other sources. We had victories all along the way, which convinced funding agencies that we had a team that could deliver. And that was also extremely important. The growth of our international team went through phases. Early high risk with a small team was absolutely essential. We needed people that were willing to commit and lay their careers on the line to start the building. But afterwards, we needed a larger team to field all of the instrumentation of the telescopes and do the work. Uh, as, I, as, as people say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, the technical challenges I've already talked about, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that here, except to say that harnessing Moore's law was a decision and it has paid off. We navigated politics. We had to absorb very well-funded new collaborators who came in who wanted to see where their place in the project was going to be. We needed large international facilities to join us, and we had to convince them that this was a worthy scientific endeavor. We had to create this large collaboration. And then, interestingly, the larger we got, the more institutional interests began to take over. And I could talk for another hour about why that is good or bad, mostly, in my view, bad. Because as soon as institutional interests come into play, they dilute the scientific focus then decisions start to be made based on whether it's good for an institution rather than whether it's good for the science. And, and the last little bit of lessons here is we did take calculated risks. I, I do like to say we jumped off cliffs and invented parachutes on the way down, but not really, only kind of. 
sort of. We jumped off cliffs when we knew we had a pretty good chance of inventing a parachute on the way down. So we developed technology and precursor results that made it low risk. We assembled a team of very energetic early career researchers mixed with very experienced um, senior people. And we mitigated all the major risks. But in the end, some risk was out of our hands. I mean, maybe when we looked close enough in, the gas would be too hot and we wouldn't be able to image this ring. But we knew that we had taken as much risk out of the situation as possible. I've already talked about creative tension, embracing multiple paths and including them all was integral to our process. And then of course, with any big collaboration, it's all about when things don't go smoothly. Uh, one of the original six papers that we published was delayed because there was internecine combat between some of our investigators. Thankfully, we were able to resolve that because we had a deep enough bench in our research team that we could bring people in to adjudicate. Um, and then there were the security issues that I talked about with the large millimeter telescope. What happens when your postdocs are held up at gunpoint on the way to the telescope? Uh, we also broadened the base. We launched the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard. I'm very proud uh, to say that we now work with mathematicians, with theoretical physicists, even with historians and philosophers, all focusing on the black hole, which levers the Event Horizon Telescope to be something much larger. And I also want to have a shout out to the extended EHT family. Uh, we're all obsessed in this field, but you don't want to let passion drift too much into obsession because then it becomes fanaticism and then you have trouble at home. Uh, there's nobody in this collaboration I know of that has not stressed the home life a little bit. So we, attention must be paid to, to the family and I'm very grateful for the support of mine and they have been long suffering and I very much appreciate that. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll, maybe we'll save this for the discussion session, Ken, because I realize we're going a little bit long, but I, I want to point out that people tend to think of the black hole result as true. They do not question it. When I get into taxis, people would say, oh yes, the black hole, I understand that. This is a very clear curve. And I'm sure that some, some of you know what this is. This is the atmospheric CO2 at the Mauna Loa Observatory. Why is it that people believe the black hole result, but we have a problem with global warming when there's something that is equally as clear in the data? We should ask ourselves that, and we should ask ourselves what role science can have at universities and research centers to bolster scientific literacy and translate belief in the black hole image to belief in climate change. So I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, this has been an inspiring journey for, for all of us. I hope it's been inspiring for you. And I really look forward to hearing some of the questions and comments. So thank you very much. Chef. That was uh, absolutely spectacular. Uh, the, the degree of um, detail and transparency and insight you gave into team collaboration and how you got it done actually leaves me with very few questions about what you <laughs> achieved. Um, it leaves many of us on this call, although this is a mixed audience of physicists and, and uh, medicine and other types of, and other uh, participants, um, to think about what some of the analogies are in healthcare. There clearly are great team science projects in healthcare as well, but ones that are trying to solve the healthcare delivery system are scuttled by far more uh, incursions of um, business interests, um, data that's very difficult to share because of privacy, mm -hmm. uh, competition, um, and sort of lack of these structures being in place. So I think we are very, very inspired um, to take this success and to think about what that might look like for us um, in solving uh, problems in healthcare. Let me go therefore to a couple of um, uh, questions from the audience. I also wanted to just, um, uh, uh, point out that it's a good thing that your disk drives weren't coming on the 737 Max. That's all. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're, we're you must have been nervous. You must have been nervous when those things went 
you know, when they were handed off to the FedEx delivery guy. Yeah, yeah, we 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 update the tracking numbers pretty constantly. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. All right, so we have a question from uh, Jeff Scargill. Um, will the decommissioning of the Caltech submillimeter observatory have an effect on prospects for future observations? Oh wow, someone's doing their homework. So so in two thousand six. Uh, I went to the summit of Mauna Kea to work on the Caltech Submillimeter Observatory. That was the first telescope we used in Hawaii to do that. So it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, it, so sa sadly, on that first year, there was something wrong with the receiver itself, with the telescope itself, that prevented us from getting detections. But the, the, the but it was used later. The decommissioning is not going to hurt us because we already have two other sites on the summit of Mauna Kea, the Submillimeter Array which is run by the Smithsonian and the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope run by the East Asian Observatory. So those are taking up the slack. But what's interesting is where the 10 meter Caltech submillimeter observatory dish might go. If it goes to a new geographic location, we would be happy to welcome it into the next generation EHT family. Another great question um, coming up. How do quantum physics inform your research or vice versa, how do your findings inform quantum physics? Wow, what, what a wonderful question. So even though at the heart of the black hole is the singularity where the world of gravitation and the world of quantum come together, we, we know that has to happen there. They're hidden from us as Penrose who won the Nobel prize this year showed us because of the cosmic censorship conjecture that everything that's happens in the event horizon stays in the event horizon. So it's cloaked from our view. At, at the horizon level, black holes tend to be pretty classical objects, at least from an astrophysical point of view. A Hawking radiation, which is a very quantum phenomenon, is far too dim for us to see with any modern technique. So we're really left with looking at classical phenomena around the black hole. So we can test GR, but we can't test quantum gravity with the event horizon telescope. Now, we're not giving up. So, I mean, there are, if, if there are ways for quantum states inside the black hole to tunnel outside and make manifest on horizon scales, and there are some theories that predict this, we should be able to see that. And those would um, be observed as time variable phenomena at the black hole boundary. Uh, so we're refining the event horizon telescope to at least be sensitive to those kinds of things. That's great. Another question. Um, how was the underlying social structure? What was the underlying social structure in your field that made this team building possible? Well, um, so I, I, would, I would say that um, we were a little bit unique in that uh, it's not often that junior researchers, early career researchers are given positions of such responsibility in an array. But uh, I and others made uh, a decision early on that we needed to give the early career researchers a lot of space and time uh, and that they would produce really extraordinary results. And they did. And uh, I, I think that uh, there were some cases in which they even surprised VLBI veterans like myself. The efficacy of some of the imaging algorithms, for example, came as something of a surprise to people who had been in the field for a long time. And that's because we were in uncharted territory. We were trying to do something that hadn't been done before. And so it was perfectly appropriate to try new things. So the, the sociology of, of not being afraid to, to embrace something new and to give everybody a chance to describe their research really helped us. Um, the other thing socially on a broader scale is that we had done enough precursor work in the high risk phase of the project so that the larger community understood this was a experiment that had to be done. We had the backing of the larger astronomy and physics community to move forward after a certain point. And, and that helped us as well. Great, here's another question. Does the collaboration apply to other astronomical challenges? Wow. So. That's interesting. What I would say is that right now we're pretty focused, like our plate's kind of full. 
you know, we're <laughs> I mean, like, you know, black holes. It's it's black holes all the way down. Uh, we're 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 happy where we are at the moment, and then, and black holes are a mystery. It's not we're not running out of unknown questions to answer about black holes that can be addressed by the Event Horizon Telescope. But we are growing. So if you want to double the number of dishes, you need to increase the scope of your project by about a factor of 10. And the reason is that the secret sauce of the EHT was that we used existing telescopes. We put bespoke instrumentation at those sites to make them a telescope that no one telescope could could be right so we we, we made an, a, a larger array with existing telescopes if you want to double the number of telescopes you have to build new telescopes in new locations so that's going to require a much bigger outlay of funding a much bigger international base and if you want to go into space then that's now we're talking 500 million dollars or so so that will be an entirely new increase of scope as well. But based on what we have, and based on the success and the track record, I like our odds. But it'll really be a whole new deal, as they say. And I think we're well positioned for that. Team science question. Um, uh, quote, I have worked on team science linking health and social scientists, community members, and policymakers. How did you help people learn from others with different backgrounds and how did you handle multi-level and multi-layer leadership requirements? Wow. Uh, well, first of all, it's a great question. Um, and I'll, hmm. well, I, a key part of the, of the EHT, uh, as I said, was splitting off into working groups. I only really talked about calibration and, and imaging, but we had instrumentation working groups, uh, we had an error analysis working groups, we had theory working groups, and we made sure that working group coordinators paired a junior person with a senior person. And that allowed a teaching component to the leadership. And we also gave leadership positions to early career people from many different backgrounds from all across the globe uh, that were, were asked to work together. So we had people leading working groups, one of whom was in Japan, and then one of whom was in California, right? Where we had, you know, working groups where one person was, you know, from uh, the East Coast of the US and another person was from Radboud University in, in Holland. And, and because of that enforced mixing, we built trust, I think, and we also built a reliance on each other. And over many years, those bonds are, are fibers that that make the whole fabric very strong now it's hard to keep something like that together we have had problems <laughs> believe me we've had problems um and and it could be that the eht in its current form may have to change in order to deal with some of those problems and i think that most people in the collaboration feel that it will but to get us to this first result uh, we did put in place there's certain protocols that we think ultimately were very useful, the ones I just described. And, and we'll use something like that going forward, but maybe not in exactly the same way. This is great. So Shep, we're just about at time. I'm going to... Um, just... Wait, I have, an, I have another hour of material. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we, we're, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we could get everyone to stay. Um, let me um, ask you just for one second. My slide is much less interesting than yours, but if you stop sharing just for one oh, yeah. second, okay. I just want to wrap us up. And um, uh, yeah, so Shep, that was absolutely spectacular. Um, it was it exceeded all expectations. I loved the fact that your answer to um, uh, the, one of the culture questions and your trainees, uh, I don't know if you said you had to give them space and time. I thought that was um, the perfect answer. <laughs> so it, it all comes down to space and time uh, and uh, you have mastered it. Um, so Shep, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, this has been um, absolutely wonderful. 
We have upcoming folks in our series. I'll just highlight it briefly, Atul Butte, uh, who is the Chief Data Science Officer for the whole University of California system. Lawrence Lessig, a professor at Harvard Law School who founded uh, the Creative Commons and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Enrico Coyera, who's uh, one of the founders of the uh, field of looking at um, sociology around um, biomedical informatics. Michael Creamer, um, university professor in economics and public policy, now at the University of Chicago, recently at Harvard, Nobel laureate in economics in 2019, and um, uh, winning that for randomized controlled trials, another, um, another uh, hot topic for medicine looking at it from the out, from outside of medicine. So with that, uh, I, I, th I think I will sign us off, let everyone uh, uh, enjoy this uh, beautiful uh, um, uh, weather. And if you're here in New England, uh, the, the, the nicest November weather we've ever had. Uh, so that may be because of uh, climate change that no one believes as Chef pointed out, but this evening we'll take it. Um, and uh, thank you all very, very much. Okay. Thanks a lot.